Are you tired of trying to conquer life's mountains by yourself? There's a better way. With Christ, we can learn to climb and win the victory over all of life's mountains. I want to tell you today as we gather in this place that, that God is calling us in the 21st century as a church back to faith. Our theme verse is Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 where the Bible says this, without faith it's impossible to please who? God, that's right. Listen to what the text goes on to say. Since the one who would draw near to God must, listen to this, believe that he exists. Do you believe that he exists? What we're doing in these eight weeks together, we're looking at the life of a character in the Old Testament by the name of Abram, whose name will be changed to Abraham. According to Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, he is the prototype of how we are to have faith. We're not looking into his life to say that Abraham saves us because he doesn't. Jesus Christ saves us. But it's helpful for our lives to, to look at men and women of faith who help us to listen to this, not to have hypothetical faith, but praise God to have authentic faith. Authentic faith is simply this. It's when you put in the fire, you actually stay in the fire because you know God's in the fire with you. Well, today we're about to see in the midst of his beginning faith, he goes south. Now, for those of us who live more in the south, there's nothing wrong with living in the south in a geographical location. Can I get an amen? But he goes south spiritually. You see, someone said this, it's not in your notes, but, but I'm going to give you this. Someone, someone said this, life is about choices. Isn't it true? Some we regret, some we're proud of. Some haunt us forever. And so here's the message that we get from that. We are what we choose to do. Abraham chose to have faith in God, and it landed him in the promised land with God. But then suddenly we see him about to take a south turn. His thoughts, Brother Lane, his thoughts and his decisions made a difference. Now look at this quote that's going to come on the screen for you. Now watch this as it comes on. Your life is a result of the decisions you make. Is that true? Now you're just lying. It's true, it's true, it's true, it's true. If you don't like your life, it's time to start making better choices. Now just to kind of whet your appetite, I'm just going to ask you just a few questions and kind of elaborate on them and we'll come to the end and see what God does. Here's the first question, are you happy with your life decisions? I meet people all the time, I love to meet people and hear their stories. This week we were, we were out doing block parties and, and I, I got to hear people's stories and some of them were happy and some of them were not happy. I know this to be the case brothers and sisters. If you know Jesus Christ, you're going to be happy. Well, I guess that's just me. Because I got, now i got one amen in the house. Those online, I hope, are doing better than you are in the house. You say, but preacher, I'm going through trials. Happiness has nothing to do with the either existence or the non-existence of trials. Happiness has to do with the joy that you have in the Lord in spite of the circumstances that you're like. Some of you right now, you're probably honest, and thank you for that. You just say, I'm not happy. Why are you not happy? You may be busy, but you're not happy. The second question is this. Have all your decisions, now watch this, have all your decisions led to good things? Look this way at me, I'll answer it for all of us. Nope. That, that's East Kentucky for absolutely not. There are things that we do in our life, there are decisions that we make that, that sometimes at best they are, they are hope. And some of you are living with, with some decisions that you've made. The Bible says, I want you to look at the text in chapter 12 and verse number 10. Here's how it begins. Now there was a famine in the land. And the scripture says, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there. One translation puts it another way. The translation says that, that he actually says this, I'll go down to Egypt and I'll stay for a while. Have you ever made a decision that you thought, this is just a momentary decision, and it turned into 20 years? Some of you are not old enough to be able to say that. Others of you are. Some of you are in the midst of right now making decisions in your life, and, and you're trying to do this. You're trying to determine, if you're a Christian, what is the will of God? Anybody? Now, that's, that's the next question. Look at it as it comes on the screen. How can we possibly know the will of God? You say, well, what is the will of God? God, before you were ever born, predetermined how that He wanted the, us to exist for His glory, and He has a path for your life. I call it the perfect will of God. But God also has a permissive will. 
A will that says, if you want to disobey me because I'm sovereign, I'm going to accomplish my purposes, and you can get in on it if you choose to, but if you choose not to, I'm still going to do my will, just like he said to Moses, Moses, I'm done with you, step up, Joshua. And it may be in your life right now that you're in a crucial moment. I don't know what your thoughts are as a title of the message today, what your thoughts are or what your decisions are. But I know this, that, that, that Abraham had begun his faith. And in this beginning moment, it seems like so, so insignificant of a decision. But I want to tell you this, that every decision is connected. Every thought you have is connected to something that's on the inside of you or something that somebody's trying to get, on, get, get from the outside into you. And that thought leads to decisions. And I know this, sometimes your thoughts can get you down a path and the devil is good at messing up your thoughts. I mean, the devil could get me mad over the simplest little thing. Anybody else? And I could get pouting. Anybody pout in the room? I'm surely no one but me, right? Anybody in the room ever just get mad and gets mad all over and don't, and after a while you don't even know why you're mad. You're just mad. Somebody comes up to you and says, what's wrong? Well, I'm mad at you. What do you do? I'll get back with you on that. I'm mad. That's some of you in this room. Others of you are just wimpy and, oh, I'm never mad, and you are a liar as well. I just want to tell you that. So here's the next question. What should we do? What should we do if we discover we made a decision that was not the will of God? Let's be truthful this morning. Some of you are fighting for something that's not the will of God. You know, the will of God is for you to be happy in Him and joyous. In the book of Ecclesiastes, we, we finished it yesterday, did we not? That, that actually Solomon said that whatever God blesses you with, He intends it for you to enjoy it, for this is your plot in life. But He intends you for you to enjoy it for His glory, do it in a right and a holy and a righteous way. Now, I want to ask you this now. Be honest with me right now. What should you do if you come to a moment, Abraham comes to a moment where there is a, there is a severe famine in the land of Canaan that God sent him to, and he says, well, I'm just going to go down to Egypt for a while. And suddenly he got out of the will of God. Have you ever been out of the will of God? How many of you know it hurts? On the front end, it may seem fine. The Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. But after that season is over, then you begin to be weary of that. I, I think about people who, who uh, like the woman who, who'd been married five times that Jesus told the story about, and that she had been divorced five times, and, and now she was living with somebody. And, and Jesus came to her in her weakest moment, because I can imagine her looking in the mirror. Can you not? She's not as beautiful as she was when she started. And the one thing that she had at her disposal was going away. What was she going to do? She can no longer attract men because of her position. There will be a moment when the allurement of you to get what you want will be over. Your health will go. Your looks will go. Your ability will go. There'll be a moment that you'll get down in a place that we saw two weeks ago. In Luke 15, it'll be a pig pen of a moment. Then what will you do? Today, all I want to do is to answer questions three and four. The first two points in this message will be to answer the first question, how can you know the will of God and do it every time? And then the last one will be, the third point will simply be this, will be to answer that last question, how do you get back? Here's the first thing you should do. Seek God's answers for your every decision. Not just the big decisions, but for the little decisions. A lot of you are the compilation of a bunch of little decisions. You know what a little, a little decision is, right? It's just this little small thing. God, I, I got this. I don't need you. For this. I got, I, if, if, if we get cancer, we're going to call upon you. God, if I end up in major trouble, I'm going to call upon you. But God, I got these bunch of little things. Listen to me. A mountain begins with one pebble that has another pebble put upon it. And eventually the pebbles become rocks and the rocks get all that dirt around it and eventually becomes a great mountain. And some of you took a molehill and turned it into a mountain because you never gave it to God. And some of you don't believe me right now because you're still big enough and ability enough and he's kind enough to you that he's letting you right now build up this mountain that you think that, that you can conquer, but you really can't. God did something for Abram. He's 75, but he's, this, he's, he's beginning in his faith. And the scripture tells us this so clearly about this fact. Here's what it says in verse 10. I'm going to read again that, but this time from the Christian Standard Version. There was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to stay there for a while because the famine in the land was severe. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, now watch this, Sarah, look what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Well, duh, they're walking together. They just came into the land together. This is your wife. Now notice what he says, they will kill me 
but let you live. Pause. Hit the pause button with me for a moment. If you know anything about Egyptian culture in that day, the pharaohs, it, it, it is common historical knowledge, the pharaohs did not like the Egyptian women. Because they said this, it's in, the, it's in their history. I was in Cairo a year ago in February and went to the National Museum. It's right there for anybody to see their history. I saw the, the tombs. I, I've been to the pyramids, and I've seen this, and so I'm not just talking. I've actually visited there and know the experience. And here's the deal. The pharaohs didn't like the Egyptian women because they thought they were weak, and they did not think they were as beautiful. So they were always trying to find women from other countries. And so what they would do is this, that they actually hired people. Their total job was to go throughout the land of Egypt and to look for these women. Remember another woman by the name of Esther? You see that consistent in the Bible. And so what would happen was that these guys would find these women, and if they happened to be married to somebody else, guess what would happen? The Pharaoh would just say off with their head, Bob. It'd be just like dying so beautiful, you'd be gone. I'm just telling you that. You'd just be gone in a moment. And so here's the deal. Abram said, man, we're going to go down here. You're 65, but now watch this. Apparently because they were followers of God and people lived as twice as long, a 65-year-old lady probably looked like a 25-year-old lady. She was a looker, and Abraham said, now listen, honey, if, you don't, if we don't lie here now, I'll die within a moment. I want to ask you this today. Here, here's the deal. Here's the question that's going to come on the screen. What is your typical process in decision making? What do you usually do? I mean, just really, come on now. You have the typical process. There's some things, Marcia, probably Danny makes the decision about, right? And some things or maybe at least one. No, I'm just kidding. Or there's some things you make the decision about. It's at our house that we're sure some things she makes the decision. And here's the one we don't want everybody. Y'all ever do this when you want to ask, do you want something? What do you want to eat? Anybody ever do that? We have had more fights and more frustration over the fact that I just want to eat what she wants to fix. And she just wants to fix what I want to eat. And because I don't know what she has in the house, I don't know what to ask. And so that's my rationalization. And also, I don't want to make it too hard on her. And so she looks at me and she says, I'm tired of fixing the same 75 things. And that's about the truth. And so we get into this loving, godly moment of no prayer, an all-out fight. Well, fix whatever you want. Well, I want to fix I love you. I'll fix what you want. And so we end up, like we did last night, we went to Zaxby's. <laughs> I mean, just, that's, just, it's like, what is the will of God? Now, that's kind of funny, and we laugh about that. But how do you live your life? I wrote some things down, just to be really clear. Some things are just obvious, right? We make the obvious choice. Abraham was not intended to get anything into anything heavy. It was just a temporary stay. And the truth is, when push comes to shove, when something's severe, we just make quick decisions. Am I right? It was a severe family. It was not like that, that it was just a little bit bad and, and they could come back in a week. No, no, it had not rained. You see, in the, in the era of the Chaldeans, we're told that it was a fertile area like living in Cairo. If you live in Cairo, it's going to rain. There's the water there, right? There's the Nile River. So you go down by the Cairo at the, and you see all of these bushes and all the greenish. But you get out five miles, right? But then you get out five miles, there's nothing but desert. And so Abraham had no experience with it not raining. He'd never been into a famine before, and so his automatic thing was this. The obvious thing to do is to go where it is. Here's second. Some of us decide there's no other choice. See, if you grew up without God, there's no other choice. The word miracle is not in your vocabulary. I give you this warning. If you are totally nothing but a rational person, it's good to be rational because you help us in life. And some of us are not need to be more rational. I get that. But if all you are is a rational per person, you'll never believe in miracles. You'll live your life, and just the obvious is there, and you'll find yourself, there's no other choice. This is just what's going on. This is what, this is what we do. Next, write this down. We decide to take the path that others have chosen. Some of you do that. You're taking the path that other people have chosen. This is just what they do. They bought a car. I'm going to buy a car. They bought a house. I'm going to buy a house. They did this. I'm going to. It is the obvious choice. It's a choice that other people are making. And when you read Scripture, Abraham's son would do the same thing. He'd go down into Egypt, and he would lie. Do you know that, that Imelech, that is, the, that is the father of two boys, that one of them would marry a woman by the name of Ruth, he would go down to the Moabites intended to stay just a short period of time in the book of Ruth, and he would stay ten years and die, and his boys both would die down in a pagan land. And I find out myself all the time now that there's no difference between the church and the world. We divorce at the same rate that the world does because we think that's what they did, and that's 
the only option. Some of you today think that the only option is, 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 a, is a secular school and, and, and many other things. They're the only option that you have. You think this is how it goes. And some of you have lived your whole life and you've, you've only walked hypothetically in faith and you've walked actually in the flesh. Now, now write, this, write this, this, this down. We seldom realize the impact our decisions have on others. I, I, I wrote this in my notes. It's not in yours. The well-worn path is not always the best path. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 through 14, He said there's a broad road that everybody takes that leads to destruction, but there is a narrow road. How many of you young people in this room are really taking the narrow road? Everybody else is having free sex, but you're saving yourself for God's person. How many of you in this room that, that are tithing when everybody else is taking 100% and wasting it on themselves, and you're discovering with giving God 10% that He gives you the 90 and you do more with 90 than other people do with 100 how many of you are discovering in your life today that the well-worn path is the path that other people have taken and we, and we don't even take the time to realize where they are? We only see them on the Facebook. Can I tell you, Facebook is a bunch of baloney. Everybody's happy. They're sitting there at the restaurant eating, but they didn't tell you about the fight they had to get there. They tell you about all the sacrifice and all the other things. And we always look at Hollywood and we want to mirror ourselves after those pagan people whose lives are dis disrespectful and they're discouraging and defeated. And we let them set the agenda for our thoughts. And all the while, God says, I've got a better plan for your life, thoughts and decisions. But now, now notice this. We sometimes do this. We consider God's will for others to be His will for our lives. Two generations from now, from the time of Abraham, we'll do it at, at student camp as we talk about plans, gods or ours, and we'll see Joseph going down to Egypt because God wanted him to. Sometimes you'll just say, well, Brother Keith did that, that's what I should be doing. This is what everybody else is doing. It has to be God's will. I want to tell you until God moves in my heart, I don't care if it's everybody's will in the church, if, if everybody's doing it, if God's not telling me to do it, I'm not going to be doing it. And I want to encourage you in that today. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 20, Wisdom calls out in the street. She makes her voice heard in the public square. She cries out above the commotion. She speaks at the entrance of every gate. Wisdom is for you. Abraham, for some reason, in this young moment of his faith, which had been begun by faith when this famine came, and he did not even ask God. He just said, Sarah... They got water and food in Egypt, and let's go. Some of you, that's why your credit card is where it is today. That is why you are right where you are today, because you chose to follow what seemed to be obvious. So I want to tell you this, submit every decision to God. Secondly, I would tell you this, stay focused on being godly in your walk with God. They go down, and all of a sudden, there they are. I wonder how, how, how Sarah must have felt when her, when her husband said, um, tell them that I'm your brother. Now, here's a good Baptist way to do it. The truth of the matter was, she was his half-brother. Now, now, not even in eastern Kentucky do we do that now. It's just not right. Where I'm from, it's just not right. But the way in that day and time, she, she was uh, one part of the family was his, but not. And so, so he's actually just saying a half lie or inverted. It's a half truth. You know, we sing around here sometimes that, that it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. Well, the truth is, it's about both. It's about where you're going. It's also about how you get there. Some of us sacrifice our lives by the way that we're going. So when we get there, we can't enjoy it because we're so messed up on the way there. We got there hook and crooked. We can't enjoy it because we're, we're covering up for what's going to come out. Others of us, it's the fact is that, that we're so hungry for the where we're getting to that we'll be ruthless. It doesn't matter how we get there. Can you imagine how Sarah must have felt in that moment? They leave and they go down into Egypt. She's so beautiful. And Pharaoh saw her, the officials did, and, and praised her to Pharaoh. And the Bible says in verse 16, he treated Abraham well because of her. When he found out, wow, this is, this is the sister, here's what he did. I'll give him flocks, herds male and female donkeys, male and female slaves, and camels. I wrote this down to see if it makes any sense. Abraham's net worth grew, but his net faith started to shrink. 
As you have lived your life, what has grown in you, in your influence and in your net worth, in your mind, in your life? How, how do you feel about yourself? Some of you feel like you're on top of the world. Let me ask you, are you underneath God at the top of the world? Some of you are on the bottom right now, and you just, you're just absolutely broken in your, your path right now, and you just don't know what to do. I want to ask you this, how do you make your decisions? Abraham teaches us in this moment that, that you can be a believer, make the wrong decision. Jesus, in his first sermon that he ever gave on the earth, he, all the Word of God is his. He is the living Word of God. But in his first sermon, remember it, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. How many remember that sermon? Remember he gets out with the blessedness. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for, for, the, for they shall see God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And he goes right on down through those, and the rest of the whole message is amplifying those things. Jesus comes to the end of the message and he summarizes it and, and it's absolutely a shock. He says this. Now I want to tell all of you that here today, not every one of you who says that you belong to God will inherit the kingdom of God. And he gives this story, doesn't it, Bob? He gives this story about two, two guys. Both of them went to church together. Both of them heard the same thing. But they chose in their thought and their decision to live totally a different way. One chose to live their life, to build their life on Jesus Christ. So when the storms come, and they will storm, and the tough decisions will come, you're going to face a lot of tough decisions. Right now, you think that, that, that you can make it, but I'm telling you, there have been storms that have happened in Sherry's life and in my life that we, that we had no clue what to do. I mean, no clue what to do. Other people give you counsel, but if there, there was no peace in our heart. And you may be right now in your life going through a moment that you maybe think is a little pebble, but it's a part of a mountain and a rock. And if you develop a pattern now of operating in the wrong way, it will go with you throughout your entire life. God was about to straighten Abraham out. And just to be honest with you, Brother Mike, I don't understand why that for most of us, God doesn't step in that way. You know, in Galatians chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, it says, Do not be, God is not mocked, for what a man sows, he will reap. If he sows to his flesh corruption, he will reap eternal destruction. But if he sows to, to the Spirit, he will reap eternal life. So I want to ask you, why did Abraham go down to Egypt? Here's some options. Maybe he was fearful. Look on the screen. Maybe he was operating in fear. Maybe he feared for his life. Man, what kind of example was that in the eyes of his wife? I wonder, secondly, was he operating in the flesh? You ever operate in the flesh? To be flesh means that, that you get out of the will of God. I, I wonder how Sarah felt. Did she think, man, we've hit the big time? Was she in it with him? Because the truth is, she was raised a pagan too. And so I, I believe they were in it together. So how do you know that? When you get to chapter 16, you're going to see her do something even worse. See, some of you blame somebody else, but the truth is you're in it together. I put the ring on Sherry's hand, but thank God she said yes. I'm pastor of this church because you, thankfully you said yes. We all make decisions together. Our thoughts and decisions are not exclusive to us. Where you work, they influence you. Where you go to school, they influence you. Your children influence you. Everybody's got an impact on you. So let me ask you, whose voice is the loudest for you? Is it the flesh? Is it fear? Or maybe he was just self-centered. Write it down, he was self-centered. I mean, who would say this now? The snake is there, honey. I'm going to climb the tree. God help you as you work with it. Sir, I know you're tired from life, but your number one assignment is to provide, to protect, and set the pace for your home. It is your job, but my wife's so good at it. You know why? Because you've given her too much practice. She's had to stand in the gap for you, but I want to tell you at my house, my wife is not going to stand in the gap for me. 
Because I know that my God is able and that I am to lead and she is to follow. Not because of arrogance, but because I am following Him. And we walk together. As a single person in this church, you are called to follow the Heavenly Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But if you're operating in fear today, I want to tell you something. That will lead to your flesh. And then before long, you know what will happen? It will be self-centered. Self-centered people who turn and give their life to God become the greatest servants of God because they already got it in them to serve and do something. They just now do it for God. Now, remember that last question that I asked you? I remember question three was how do you know the will of God? Well, it's simple that you seek God for every decision. You walk godly as you walk through. But that fourth question was there. The question was what do you do if you mess up? Here's what you should do. And listen to this. Step back to where God last spoke to you. You say, well, what do you mean? If you say, if you are, if you are, if you really are, I'm not questioning you between you and God. If you are, if you've done what the Bible says, if you are saved and are out of the will of God, there's there's things that you should do. You should step back. You know what the Bible says that happens? The Bible says this, that Abraham realizes he made a mistake. You see, how do you know? Look at verse 17. But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his household with severe plagues because of Abram's wife, Sarah. So Pharaoh sent, sent for Abram and said, What have you done to me? Now listen to me. Don't you count on God doing this for you. This is a unique moment because God is sovereign and because that Sarah was to give a birth to a child who would ultimately give birth to the Son of God. And so God stepped in and says, I'm stopping this now because it's my sovereign will. That's not the way it usually happens, Brother Danny. God usually allows you to get so broken. Why is it that the man loses his wife before he repents? Why is that? Why is it that that the teenager has a wreck or or goes through some type of thing and ends up in jail and then they just repent? Why is that? Because brokenness comes hard. Pharaoh woke up, a lost man and says, hey, you did something wrong, Abraham, and your God struck us. And you know what God does? God allows his servants now, the servants of Pharaoh, to say, let's go out of here. How long has it been? Since someone came to you maybe and said, aren't you a Christian? Pagan people stepping in. God uses all kinds of things. And so here's what he does. He goes, the Bible says, he goes back into the land of Canaan and he comes right back to where he was and he gets on his face before God and he offers a sacrifice and worship to God. What a moment it must have been. Three words I give you. He remembered, he repented, and he returned. He remembered where he was. He said, God, I repent. And God, I want to return. Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Jesus says, I have this against you. You have left your first love. But if you will remember from where thou thou hast come and you repent and do the first work, I will again come and have fellowship with you. But I want to tell you this. You can't remember where you've never been. Who in this room could really come up to me and say, Keith, let me tell you about not only the day, but the life I live by authentic faith. I say to student leaders, and I say to those of you that have been leaders, where are you now and what are you doing with your life? Anybody can lead on a committee. But it takes somebody of real faith to remember, to repent, and reset. So here's our takeaways. It's, it's right here. If you're living beat down with regrets, remember, repent, and reset your life to obey Him. And I want to tell you something. God's about to explode something in you. What you used to be is nothing compared to what you're about to do. I talked to someone this, a few weeks ago who said to me, said, Pastor, I used to go to church all the time. I, I used to really enjoy it, kind of got away from God, but there ain't nothing like I've got now. See, God's a God of a second chance. But thoughts and decision, it's up to you. Others of you are in this place today. If you're living in the beauty of His will, rejoice in Him. Some of you are in that right now. Just keep doing what you're doing. You're going to come to tough moments, but understand this. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Others of you, it's this. If you're living the beginning moments of a decision, if you're in the beginning moments of a decision, you know what to do, don't you? Come on. You know what to do. And if you'll walk by faith and not by sight, God will use you bigger than He ever has. 
To learn more about our ministries, check us out at jacksonfbc.com.